We are in a series of messages from the gospel according to John. And today we're going to look at a story from the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5. And while you're making your way there, because uh, we're going to cover a lot of territory today, I want to tell you a story. Uh, it's Many of you are familiar with Ted Turner, media mogul Ted Turner. He founded uh, the cable news network, CNN. He's former owner of the Atlanta Braves and had a lot of headlines during those years and uh, headlines uh, during the years he was married to Jane Fonda, among uh, others, during the course of his life. He received an award in 1990. The, it's called the Humanist of the Year Award. And in his acceptance speech, this was in Orlando, Florida, he shared a story. He shared a story about his uh, very young sister when he was growing up. and His sister... Uh, became very ill, I mean, to the point of uh, critically ill, unto death. And he was raised in a God-fearing family, and Ted Turner says that he, he prayed and prayed that God would heal her, that God would restore his sister. And instead, she got progressively worse, and she died. And Turner told the audience that day, from then on, I knew, even as a kid, there was no God up there. What kind of a loving God uh, would have allowed my sister to suffer and die? And he said, the rest of my life, I will depend on myself only. And he said, I'm going to depend on myself, not on an unfeeling phantom being that did not exist. I read a newspaper account of a family in California. They, they brought a $50 million lawsuit against four different aspirin companies. And it was related to their son who had a had been ill with chicken pox and uh, taking the product, he had suffered permanent brain damage and contracted Ray's syndrome by taking the aspirin. And so that was the case and went to court. And the court ruled that the son, in fact, did not have Ray's syndrome and was not entitled to damages as a result. And this is what the mother said in response to the court verdict. We were hoping for the best. I had hoped that the truth would prevail and it hasn't. It's going to be hard to put my faith back in God again. You know, things like that happen all the time. Things that are tragic, things that are hard to understand, things hard to explain, things that are just going to be hard on our faith in God. And when they do, uh, a lot of folks just throw up their hands and say, how did God let this happen? Why could God let something like this happen? They become bitter, uh, cynical, angry. I appreciate this quote from Arthur, Arthur John Gossip. He said, Some people, when belief comes hard, they fling away from the Christian faith altogether. And then he says, But in heaven's name, and by the way, he says this from the depths of tragedy, But in heaven's name, fling away for what? If, if, you, if you were to abandon God in the midst of crisis, where would you go? Only to hopelessness because there is nowhere else to go. Crisis and pain and suffering have no meaning except to be crisis, pain, and suffering apart from a relationship to God through Jesus Christ. But in Him, you find meaning even in the hardest of times. Life is a mystery. And I, the, the longer I live and the more stories I encounter, the more I feel it. And much of what happens in life is beyond us. We don't understand why some people have cancer. We don't understand why people have heart attacks and why people suffer constant pain. Meanwhile, now here's the rest of it. Meanwhile, there are people who are just real jerks in the world. And they seem to just be floating along problem-free and everything's going great for them. There's some biblical writers who ask that same question. Why do, why do bad people, why does it always work out for those guys? Meanwhile, here I am trying to serve God and things are hard for me. Why is this so? And to tell you the truth, some of you have heard me say this at some memorial services that were hard times. If I did come up with a great why answer for you on everything, it wouldn't really satisfy you and it wouldn't make you hurt any less. And it wouldn't... Uh, bring you any more uh, encouragement maybe in the moment if I had all the why answers the Bible is a book of how answers 
how, how do you bear up? How do you go on? How do you wake up tomorrow and, and, and take on the day? How do you persevere? And the Bible is full of answers. Look to God who is our hope in all things. Now, I say there is not uh, a lot of why. There's just not a lot of why that makes it all go away and feel better in the moment. But there's a lot of why in the Bible. We need faith to persevere. You remember the three uh, Hebrew young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were about to be thrown into a fiery furnace for honoring their God instead of honoring an evil king. And they said, if this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not... Be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. They expected a miracle. A miracle certainly possible, but if not, if that miracle didn't come, it was not going to shake their faith in God. Their faith did not require a miracle. They were going to be true to God with or without the miracle. We need the faith of Job. Job, from the depths of sorrow, having lost almost everything except his life, said, of God. Even if he kills me, I will hope in him. Even if he takes my life, I will continue to trust in God. Why suffering? Let's look at a couple of stories from uh, the Bible. They're going to help us. We're going to draw some things from here as well as some other places in God's word. We're going to pick up in John's gospel, chapter 4, verse 46 and it says, And Jesus came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, we talked about this last week. He'd been down the south, southern part of the country. Now he's heading up to the north. He went to Jesus and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. He wants him to come from Cana. To Capernaum. So Jesus said, and it's really a pushing back kind of statement. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. And the man believed and the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. And he was, as he was going down, his servants met him and told him his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said, your son will live. And he himself believed and all of his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Remember, John in his structure of his book has seven signs, seven miraculous things that he points to to prove Jesus is who he said he was. Then chapter 5 begins. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. One man who was there, had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up and take your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and he walked. Now, verse 5, now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who'd been healed, it's the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, the man who said, take up your bed and walk. Uh, they asked him, who is the man who told you to take up your bed and walk? And it's a little further down that we discover. He discovers the man is Jesus. Okay, let's remember, John, in his gospel, has organized the story of Jesus around certain themes, those signs, seven signs, or seven other things. 
And always with these pur- this purpose, these things are written. John tells us in John chapter 20, these things are written. That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. Every step, everything that he does is pointed toward that we might believe. Now, in these two stories today, we find two of the seven signs that give evidence that Jesus is who he said he was. He is Jesus, He is Christ, He is God, He is Son, He is Savior. He's all the things that He declared Himself to be. And these two things help point us in that direction. Jesus' second sign of the Gospel of John takes place in Cana of Galilee. Now, as John notes, the first sign was turning water into wine in Cana. Now Jesus is in Cana. This father, he's he's a nobleman, he's an important guy. He comes to Cana from Capernaum, so it's he performs the miracle in Cana, sort of, long distance, because the healing actually takes place in Capernaum, about 20 miles away. He comes, can you heal my son? A desperate father, a royal official, his son on the verge of death. And Jesus responded with a little bit of a test, a little bit of a pushback to, to determine where the man's faith was placed. Was he just looking for help? Or was he looking for a relationship to the Savior? And he passed the test. And Jesus healed the father's son completely. See, it wasn't enough that Jesus would just do the healing. Two other things take place that are part of his bigger plan. The man believes, but Jesus has a bigger plan than that. That his whole household would also believe. And he carries it forward in a way that God is truly glorified through everything that takes place. Now, third sign begins in chapter 5. And it opens with Jesus. And we spent a whole Sunday on this just a few months ago. He returns to Jerusalem, heals a a man crippled, lame, at the pool of Bethesda. And there's a tradition. It's a legend. It's a superstition. And my translation takes it out because it wasn't in the oldest of our manuscripts. But it helps to explain what's going on. There was a tradition, a legend, that... An angel would come, stir the waters. If you were the first one to hit the pool after the water was stirred, you could get healed. And this guy's complaining, well, I'm always too slow. Nobody's here to help me. Woe is me. He's really trapped in his infirmity. And now Jesus' power is going to come. And it's greater than the years that have gone by, 38 years And Jesus' power is greater than a superstition of men. Uh, And he, he comes because Jesus is the master of time. 38 years is nothing. He's the ruler over all tradition and conquers those things. And he heals this man. Now, I read on down because I wanted to get that information in verse 5. That day was the Sabbath and... The Jewish leaders, they they go after this because Jesus should not be healing on the Sabbath is their opinion about things. And In John's gospel, from from that verse on, the religious leaders in Jerusalem are after Jesus. From this point, they are mad and they are taking every opportunity to take him out, take him down. And what happens in verse 5 is going to carry out all the way to Jesus dying on the cross. Now, Jesus performed these two miracles in the lives of these two desperate people. And some of you would say, I'm desperate people. I feel it. Some of you know desperate people. People who's, uh, they're desperate. Their family, their friends are desperate for them. And it reminds us we live in a world desperate for healing, desperate for help, desperate for hope, desperate for heaven. And he healed them with this miraculous demonstration of power. This is what I want you to see in those two stories. And it it illustrates a lot of Jesus' ministry. Jesus did an incredible thing. It's a sign. Everybody, this is incredible. What a great day. But here's what you need to remember. Jesus didn't heal every person in Israel during his earthly ministry who needed healing. In fact, Jesus didn't heal every person that was around the pool of Bethesda on that particular day. Just this one guy. And this is, uh, this is a hard one for us. 
a lot of these folks, Jesus passed close, but they would continue in their pain and continue in their suffering. And uh, many do today. And so what is God's purpose in that? What is his purpose in our suffering? What's his purpose in our difficulty when it doesn't all get tied up with a bow quickly and easily? And we see some of it in these two stories, the purpose for it. And again, this, this isn't going to make you hurt less if you're in a time of deep difficulty and suffering. However, it may find uh, a reason that helps you to carry on. Why do things work out the way they do? Why do we experience hardship and difficulty? What is God's purpose in suffering? We're going to do nine things today, and we'll get you out sometime this weekend. Here's the first thing. Suffering works to advance the gospel. We see that in both of these stories. In these two cases, it's the suffering of illness that helps spread the gospel. And I'm sure they're all, this worked for all kinds of different suffering too. Suffering comes in a lot of different packages. Paul was suffering because of persecution. He was doing exactly what God told him to do in the ways God told him to do it. And he was getting beaten up, his life threatened because of it. And he says in Philippians, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. When you suffer hardship, pain, it's one of the challenges. See, if this is to be my lot, if this is what God has entrusted to me, dear God, please do not let me waste this. If I would pray always for your healing and deliverance and for mine as well. But if not, God, let me be found faithful in it that, that the testimony would touch people with the good news of Jesus Christ, with the gospel that... If, if I'm going to have this, if I'm going to suffer through this, if this is going to be my journey, don't let me waste it, but let me use it to your glory. By the way, that only works in the life of a believer. For someone who's not a believer, it's just suffering. There's no purpose, there's no meaning. The, the Ted Turner quote from earlier, there, there's, there's nothing that's positive in any of that. No, no hope and no peace, and no love, and no joy. But for the Christian, even in suffering, there's such great opportunity, and including the advance of the gospel. Here's the second thing. Suffering spurs other believers to keep trusting Christ. Now think about a couple of applications from that passage we just read in Philippians 1, about his suffering advancing the gospel. I think it means that Paul's faithfulness in his affliction is going to spur other people to keep on keeping on. I need the example of other believers, the encouragement of other believers who are doing suffering and struggle and pain, and sickness well, uh, to, keep me, to keep me afloat. If you look at uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, the faith chapter, you see this who's who list of all these people who, and the re re repeated uh, little phrase, by faith, by faith. And here's the stuff that they did. And while they were doing their by faith stuff, they were just getting beating all the pieces for it. Some of them lost their lives for doing exactly what God wanted them to do, for being a people of faith, for leaning into a relationship to God throughout. And so by faith, by faith, by faith. And they're a great testimony, and we know that because of the first two verses of chapter 12 of Hebrews. And this points back, because it starts with a therefore. The therefore points back to all of chapter 11. Hebrews 12 begins, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, all those by faith people who did it when it was hard. Let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Through Jesus' example, through the examples of the great people of faith. It just encourages me, you know, don't give up, don't give in, don't give out. But I know a lot of believers that I've done some life with, that I'm doing life with, who are doing this really well too. And it so encourages me in the hard things that I face in life. When I see other people, by their testimony, doing hard things well. 
Third thing, suffering shows us our weakness and demonstrates Christ's power in us. Paul wrote of his thorn in the flesh in uh, 2 Corinthians. Uh, we're not told what it was. It was a difficulty that went with him every day, something that was a daily reminder to him, a constant aggravation. And he said, and he prayed to be taken away, and God told him no. Here's what it says. But he said to me, as Paul was praying, God, take this away. Deliver me. Heal me from this. My grace is sufficient for you, says the Lord, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, Paul says, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He says, my perseverance my ability to hang tough, my ability to keep shining for Christ is not because I'm such a great guy, not because I'm so super spiritual. No, it's a, it's a little deeper than that. It's, it's because uh, Christ in him. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in you will carry you forward. Here's the thing. There are people that are always watching you as a believer. All of us know people who, who don't know Jesus, and they're watching. And as important as our apologetics are that we want to defend the faith and we want to say what I believe is true, most of the world out there aren't so worried about that as they are this. Does it work? Does this faith really, can it carry you when it's hard? When all things seem lost, can, can this faith sustain and Suffering shows our weakness. Man, it's not about me. It's about Christ in me. And that is a powerful testimony. Now, number four, suffering teaches us to trust God, not our own abilities. Now, that's tied in with two and three. But this time, like number two was about being a testimony to other people. Uh, when we get to this one, it's... Uh, it's about us rather than others. Paul says, we do not want you to be, to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Suffering, pain, sickness, difficulty reminds me how much I need Christ. And, and not just in suffering, but in everything. The inclination of our hearts is always toward self-sufficiency. It's always toward, I can do this. I can, I can just push forward by the by my power of my own will. I can make this happen. And, and the difficulties we face just remind us how much we need God how much we need his power, how much we need the presence of Christ in us. I'll tell you this story. Um, I appreciate, and several of you have asked today, I appreciate your checking in on me. And I had emergency eye surgery three months ago. And uh, I am legally blind in my right eye today, still. So how's it going? Well, not that hot. I'm still driving a car, though, as you know that. Uh, with both eyes open, I, I can see fairly well at distance. Uh, it, I, I tire in reading. Uh, the doctor's trying something else uh, that'll take another month. And if that doesn't work, we have something else beyond that. But, man, for somebody who reads and writes for a living, uh, this is wearisome on me, my uh, thorn in the flesh. My left eye has been, always been my bad eye, and it's now the one I'm having to lean into to, uh, to move forward. And what I have found is this is remind, it reminds me every day when I wake up of how much I need the Lord for everything all the time. And uh, as much as I would still pray that God would deliver me from this, uh, right now it's... Uh, I still find the gift of it in what it's done in uh, how I approach my relationship to him. It's uh, changed some hard things for me. Number five, 
suffering shows us the genuineness of our faith. Here's how Peter says it. Peter was going through difficulties like Paul was going through difficulties. You've been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Tested by fire. You know, I've become battle-weary of this statement, and I see it, hear it out there all over. Well, you know, my priorities in life, you know, it's always with me. It's going to be God first, then my family, then whatever number three is. Everybody's got their number three, but they're number one, number two. But declaring that as number, God is number one, does it really, is it really borne out by your life? Is there any evidence that would actually be true? Does your calendar and your bank account give any evidence that God even has a place of priority in life? Lots of people make big claims about their spiritual life and relationship to Christ. But when suffering comes, a lot of people just wilt like a sidewalk flower in July in Texas. And it all just disappears quickly when it's hard. When it's hard to follow Jesus, to trust Jesus, a lot of things get clarified, a lot of things get revealed, a lot of things that we like to boast about. Uh, not quite uh, as strong as we might like to think. It helps to show the genuineness of our faith and our need for growth in some areas. Uh, th this wedding ring of mine's gold, and it wasn't always as pretty as it is today, as nice as it is today, because to get to this, it had to be refined by some fire. And there's a lot of refining that takes place in the challenges of life that, that show the genuineness of our faith, that make our faith what Christ wants it to be. And it's a great purpose that God uses difficulty in. Six, the suffering produces righteousness in us. Another tremendous benefit. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons, the writer of Hebrews says. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. That there, there is a result of this, a purifying and encouraging, a growth process that takes place in difficulty. You're not going to learn anywhere else except in the school of suffering. And it produces righteousness. We rejoice, Paul said to the Romans, in our sufferings. Isn't that the craziest thing you've ever heard? We rejoice in our sufferings, of all things to say, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. You know, a muscle grows stronger by being stressed, exercised, challenged, and the same is true for righteousness, right? Relationship to God. If everything is just carefree and you're just floating along, uh, there, there's not a lot of growth that's going to happen, and God will place things in our way to grow us. There's a grit and a resilience that will never develop in a greenhouse ideal environment. And God will take us to some desert places. What I have found in my times of trouble and hardship and difficulty is that that's when I really take some big steps forward in my prayer life. Where God's word starts impacting me at some new levels, some different levels, some new places that I've been passing over where my commitments get clarified of what's important and what is not important. All those things God does in righteousness. Suffering makes us value and long for what is eternal. We need to remember, so we're in the central standard uh, time uh, area of the world, the eastern standard time, mountain standard time, Pacific standard time, depending on where people are in these United States of America. But... God operates on eternal standard time. His time is just different than our time. With the Lord, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Here's the thing about God when it comes to suffering, difficulty, pain. You, you can't run ahead of God, and you can't go lagging behind God. You need to walk with God, and you need to be patient with Him because He has His own time, and He'll do what He promised, and He is faithful. He can be trusted. Some promises you have to wait for, and some promises just not going to be 
fulfilled immediately. I always wish that that's how it worked. Uh, but God has a bigger plan than me and mine and just now. Life is a mystery and much of what happens is beyond us. And it's not uh, something we understand or can explain why things happen the way they do. And we, we, I'm just not going to have answers to a lot of stuff. People sometimes come to me and say, tell me why. Well, I can't tell you why, but I can't tell you the one who has all the answers, who makes it all come together, who holds the world in his hands. In 2 Corinthians, uh, one of my go-to places for this topic, for this slight momentary affliction. By the way, when Paul's saying that, he's in a mess. Everything is tough. This light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. God didn't create us for time. He created us for eternity. We're so tied to here. Like, this is all there is. And if we're not happy here, we're going to have to keep working harder to be happy here. Like, everything is invested here. Not much about eternity, where we're going to spend forever and ever. And we try to be happy here. And man, especially as it's true in, in our culture, which makes us different than a lot of places where I've had privilege to visit in the world where they, they recognize something that we do not recognize as American Christians. I'm going to share this with you. I've said this before. I will likely have to say it again. Just to clarify, this is not heaven. Right now is not heaven. I've talked to Africans who said, you guys think now is heaven. They see it in us. You Americans, you're trying to make now heaven. This isn't heaven. This is not where all things are made right. This is where all things are pure. This is where all things are easy and, and blessed. This is not heaven. In hard things of life, one of the things that happens is it makes us long for heaven. Previous generations of Americans, you look at the hymns that they sang. They sang a lot more about heaven because they said, this is tough right now and I'm looking forward to something other than this. Americans have so much now and so much is squared away about what we can do for ourselves. Man, if I'm in a bond, I, just, I got insurance and I got money and I can get some medical help to fix it. And I'm not too worried about asking God for help. I can handle stuff myself. God brings things into our lives that take us to the end of ourselves to help us recognize we need heaven. We long for heaven. Number eight, suffering brings us heavenly reward. It really is worth your while to do this. It's worth your while to follow after our God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to surrender your whole life to Him. The reason for this is that there are just some incredible rewards waiting for you in heaven when you're living it here. Now, you accumulate the rewards by the choices that you make, the life that you live for Christ here on this earth. What you get to experience in heaven is determined by what you have done here. Now, you're not saved by the things that you do here. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But heaven is not communism where it's the same for everybody. The, I, if I'm going to go to heaven, I want to have all the heaven I can get. And so I want to accumulate as many rewards as I can because I want to experience all of God that I can for all eternity and there are rewards for certain things in eternal places. There are rewards, and those rewards are based on things that happen here. One of those things is mentioned in God's Word is suffering and how we handle suffering, how we deal with pain and difficulty in life yields eternal reward. We suffer with Him in order that we may be glorified with Him. And Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. I don't know why certain people, wonderful people, go through so, so much more hardship than other people in this life. But I do know this, for those who belong to Jesus Christ, no matter how difficult and how overwhelming it is here, there will so far outweigh anything here that you'll be thanking God for the privilege of the contrast. Number nine, suffering gives us the ability to comfort and encourage others in their sufferings. And this is from uh, 2 Corinthians first, first chapter. We suffer 
But God comforts us in our suffering. He walks with us. I'll be with you in the valley of the shadow of death. Lo, I'm with you always, even in the age. Emmanuel, God with us. That image of with is a powerful image. And First Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 1 says the reason God comforts us is not just so that could be the end of the game, but so that we can comfort other people as we have been comforted. The Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Who's, who's best equipped to help someone who's going through a, a cancer battle? Who's best equipped to help someone in, in a pain or a loss? It's the person who's been down that road already with Christ in their life. And they've leaned on Christ through it and they've learned some things about it. They don't have to be far ahead of the people around them who are suffering in the same thing, just a step or two ahead to be able to say, this is what I have learned and this is how God has helped me to comfort others as we ourselves have been comforted by God. Who's best equipped? Someone who knows Jesus and has walked the same path. I have been reading a big old biography and I'm about two-thirds of the way through. It's a fast, it's a, it's a monster of a book on David Livingston, David Livingstone, he changed it to Livingston uh, to uh, accommodate uh, some prejudices. He returned to his native Scotland after 16 years as a missionary in Africa. And it was, uh, he was an explorer, he was the first person in. He, he was dealing heavily in the slave traffic of East Africa and trying to shut that down. It was primarily influential in doing that in uh, East Africa. But he was there at a time when uh, and we go now and we just get loaded up with shots and we're taking malaria meds and all that stuff to stay healthy. And it's still hard sometimes because Africa is just full of terrible diseases. Uh, during the time he was there on his own medically, he, he, he counted up 27 different fevers that just ravaged his body, tore him apart. He, he was emaciated when he came back after those 16 years in Africa. Uh, he had a left arm that uh, just hung uselessly by his side, been mangled by a lion. And speaking to a group of students at Glasgow University, he said, shall I tell you what sustained me during the hardships and loneliness of my exile? It was Christ's promise. Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end. Even unto the end. Now, there is one thing you can trust about our Lord. When he says something, you can just bet your whole soul on it. He will be with you always. And he's not going anywhere. And, and he's going to be faithful. And he'll be faithful in ways that you don't imagine. Sometimes faithful to just bring complete healing. And sometimes faithful to walk with you through the challenge, but he will be with you to the end. He is wise. He is kind. He is grace. He is love. And he's eternal. And he makes all things right in his great big plan. Why do things work the way they do? Because God is God and, and I'm not. He knows things I don't know. He's working a plan a lot bigger than things uh, following my plan just now. Same true for you. You can trust him. He doesn't waste anything.